Well, it is good to be back after three weeks away. Uh, I will say, though, that one of the things that you have to do when you get back is pick up your life where you left off. For some reason, the mail kept coming and the junk mail kept coming the whole time that I was gone. So I went to the post office and picked up a, a brick of paper that I had to sort through. One of the things that came in the mail this week, or while I was gone at some point, was one of those cal- catalogs that invites you to be nostalgic for the past and to buy stuff in order to be nostalgic for the past. The trouble is that years ago when I saw this catalog, it reminded me of my grandparents. Now I open it up and it reminds me of myself, and I don't like that. <laughs> it's no longer Neat's foot oil and, and mustard plasters for lumbago or whatever people used to use. Now it's Tang. Stuff that I remember from when I was a kid in the 70s. It made me go back and think about what that time was like. The fact that I, and here, I, I tread gently because my mother is watching right now. <laughs> Whatever I may say about my diet as a child, I will hear about this afternoon. But I did. I grew up drinking Tang and other things like it. And I knew what orange juice tasted like because I knew what Tang tasted like. You can imagine my surprise the first time I had real orange juice and couldn't figure out why it didn't taste like Tang. Indeed, much of what I thought I knew about what I ate was from what it was I grew up eating. I knew about orange juice because I drank Tang. I knew what strawberries tasted like because I'd had (laughs) Pop-Tarts. I knew what bread was like because I had had the kind that came in the white plastic envelope with the red, yellow, and blue dots on the outside. I will not mention its name. It's like Voldemort. I knew what these things were because I had tasted them. So you can imagine the process it took over the years to transform me into the food snob that I am now. I, who would drive two and a half hours to get organic goat yogurt or whatever looked good this week in what I was looking at on Instagram, it was a long, slow process to come to recognize, first of all, that what I thought I knew was real wasn't really. What I thought I wanted wasn't really what I wanted. And then, in fact, there were things in what it was that I had been consuming weren't necessarily all that good for me. A few years ago, one of my doctoral students actually did her dissertation on this. Food additives, what we know about them and what we think they're doing to us. We are all pretty much in this this mindset now. We want to know what it is we're, we're consuming. And yet... Even so, dear friends, if we're honest with ourselves, once in a while, we still feel that pull to go back. The idea that it might be nice to have, what, Doritos and Diet Mountain Dew for lunch today. There is that desire to sprinkle just a little bit of Cheetos dust into our spirits, is there not? That's kind of where the people in the story find themselves this morning. Two weeks ago, they were fed. Real bread, literal bread, they ate literal bread, and they were truly full in the physical sense. And they were pretty happy about it. Last week, they came to Jesus and said, where's bread? We need more bread. Where are we going to get it? Give us this bread always. And probably they were thinking of the sort of bread they had gotten the week before, the literal kind that you eat, and it meets your immediate physical need. That, of course, was not what Jesus had in mind. And already at the time, he was beginning to try to redirect them toward what the deeper meaning of it was supposed to be. And this week, we have a continuation of that. He's hitting the point harder this time to try to make them see what he's trying to say. And still, they're not quite getting it. That, of course, is always the danger with signs, isn't it? In the Gospel of John, you may know that that in Bible study, we often talk about how there are signs that Jesus does, the miracles, healing and feeding, but also just the way he lives his life, what he says, how he conducts himself. Everything is meant to be a sign that points to something bigger, to the message, what it is that the, the reality of God that is already breaking into our reality but that is so far from what it is that we think we know and perhaps even further from what it is that we think we want. He's trying to give them this message and they're just not quite getting it because it's so much easier sometimes to want what it is that we think we want and what we've always had. 
so much easier to go back to the fake stuff. I won't even name it this time. And yet, it's so important to get past that because there's so much risk in staying with the fake stuff. To begin with, the bread will always be limited. No matter how hard we try, we can only make so much of it. There are only so many ovens, there's only so many people, only so much time to stick with the bread as being the thing, the sign as being the reality of God will always limit us. Not to mention that the bread will eventually go bad if we don't eat it. That's not to say that there wasn't plenty. God in this sign does a, a wonderful thing. There's far more than they could eat. You remember they had to take up the extra and hopefully do something productive with it after they had eaten. But nonetheless, it still is only at best a pale reflection of the abundance and the overflow that God intends us to see and to experience. There is no place for scarcity in the economy of God. That already is a worry, but the bigger risk that grows out of that is that perhaps we will fail to see the real message, which is that it's not what God does, but rather who God is. We hear that very plainly in the gospel this morning. Jesus says it several times, I am. Not I do or I give or I, I create or anything else. Simply, I am. Which opens up so many more possibilities that are so far beyond our imagining. So far beyond anything we could ask for or expect from God. And yet there it is opened for us. It's understandable why the people at the time wouldn't have gotten it. Either from the practical sense, that they, they lived hand to mouth. So the idea that someone would provide them with what they needed, indeed more than they could have asked for of what they needed, must have seemed very attractive. And it would to us too. There are plenty of people in this world who wonder where their next meal is coming from. If that doesn't happen to be us, at least today, perhaps we can at least imagine what that is like. But it's also true at a spiritual level. They lived knowing who God was, or who they had been told God was by the Torah, what they expected God to do in the world, particularly when they lived in conditions of occupation and oppression. So to find that that's not exactly what God is offering would perhaps have been confusing to them. And certainly they're not alone in that. If you think about every single painting you've ever seen of the second coming of Christ, Jesus is coming down out of the clouds in great majesty and everybody on the ground is looking up. In that moment, everyone is made fully aware. Everyone is very conscious of who Jesus is, what God has been up to all this time, and all of those people who have been followers of Jesus are vindicated in what it is they have been doing. They have been proven right. Why would we not want that to be what God is offering us? Personal vindication. Look, see, I wasn't the foolish one. They were the foolish one. Very attractive. There's a whole industry. How many of the Left Behind books have you seen or have you read? And all of the, the, the spawn of Left Behind, it's a whole industry of books telling us exactly what God intends for the world, what God plans to do as if anyone can know that, exactly how it will work out to be just right for those who are reading the book. And yet, dear friends, if we learn anything from what Jesus says, it is, in fact, that there is so much mystery in I am that we can scarcely claim even to fully comprehend it. Luckily, the good news in it is that God seems to want to draw absolutely everyone into this new and unimaginable reality. God does not drive anyone away. God does not deny the blessings of God to anyone who will accept them. So, dear friends, the real thing is open to every one of us. 
the true bread. Nothing fake, no additives is right there for us if only we will take it. With that clear in our heads, what falls to us then is to figure out for each one of us what our false bread is, what the additives are that we're putting into our souls day by day that have no business being there. Maybe your false bread is the hope that God is going to come soon and prove you right. Maybe your false bread is your hope that God isn't going to come soon. There are plenty of people who are a little worried about what might happen if they ever had a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. Maybe your false bread is the belief that God has given us what we're going to get and we're on our own and somehow we have to manage with our own resources. There will be nothing more a mentality of scarcity. Maybe, and here I pause because I am now confessing my own sin, Maybe your false bread is the belief that somehow you're fully competent to handle it all. I have everything I need. I can manage. I'll ask God for the big stuff. What is that? Medicare Part B that covers catastrophic hospitalizations? <laughs> Just as long as I have that piece, I'm okay with everything else. Where is the false bread in your heart and mine and ours? Where are the additives? What are the attitudes that we are bringing to our encounter with God that leave a bad taste in our mouths, leave a false taste in our mouths? Where are we still drinking tang when the orange juice is sitting right there next to us? That is my challenge to you and to me, to put down the tang, put down the Pop-Tart, and taste the bread of life. See where it is right there in front of us, being offered to us again and again and again as we go through our lives. We have only to accept it, only to taste and see that God is good, and live in the blessing God intends for each one of us. Amen.